Hello and welcome back to our discussion on promoting interdisciplinary care at the intersection of faith and neuroscience. I'm Dr. Leonard Matheson with the Faithful Brain Institute. Today we're going to be talking about the Counseling Progress Assessment Baseline Report, the fourth section of that report focusing on diagnostic considerations. This section of the report lists the 28 most common DSM-5 diagnoses in the areas of anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance. I present both the DSM-5 and ICD-10 CM codes, and I remind the professional that when we take a look at the NIH PROMISE scores for anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance, if we have a percentile of 85 or higher, this requires further investigation of diagnostic status using a clinical interview and or testing. And here's the section on anxiety in the Diagnostic Considerations page. We have 10 different anxiety diagnoses. These are the 10 most common that a counselor is likely to run into. There are others, of course. And so there are two strategies to use when we're working on diagnosis. First is to come up with the provisional diagnosis. For example, I've got three here that I'm going to treat as provisional. The post-traumatic stress disorder, the acute stress disorder, or an adjustment disorder with anxiety. And clients will come in to us with symptoms and behaviors and reports of problems that uh, could fit within any three of these. But the work that we're going to do in the first session or two is going to help differentiate among those three. At the end of our first session, we're going to offer a provisional diagnosis. Or, alternately, we could offer these as differential diagnoses. And this is actually what I prefer. And look at this photo. This is from Katie Joy Crawford, who has presented a wonderful photo collection on the web called My Anxious Heart. I encourage you to look at it. It's really quite moving and uh, I think very accurately describes many of the symptoms that people with anxiety have. I really want to thank Katie for the work that she's done. I think it's very helpful to counselors. And so in this approach with differential diagnoses, we're going to offer all three of the diagnoses that we're considering. And this is a different approach from taking a look back at provisional diagnosis where we're offering one or the other. With differential diagnoses, we're going to list all three and then move forward over the next couple of sessions trying to focus in on which it is. And this is helpful in many ways. First of all, it sharpens our thinking. Secondly, as we move through it, we're helping the client learn about what the differences are among the three potential disorders that they have. And this empowers the client to be able to move forward with more knowledge, which I think is really crucial for a good counselor to do. And so how do we actually do differential diagnoses? Well, there are five steps. I'm going to take you through all five of these, beginning with ruling out malingering or factitious disorder. Now, for most of the people that come into a clinical counseling practice, you don't have to worry about this, but you should keep it in mind. It's part of the formal process that we want to walk people through. In my practice, I probably have about 10 or 15, 20 percent of my clients who have uh, lit litigation going on. And in those cases, I've got to rule that out. And I'm able to rule it out or rule it in, depending upon uh, what I see in here. That's really going to help me determine whether or not I can proceed with the person and what I can do to proceed with the person. The second issue to rule out is uh, a drug or chemical cause. Now, we aren't physicians, but we will develop expertise. The longer you work as a counselor, the more expertise you'll develop in terms of uh, identifying drug, drug or chemical causes to most of the behaviors that we run into. And with anxiety disorders, I'm interested in a few chemical causes. The first one that I look for is uh, an overuse of caffeine. And caffeine at higher levels can produce anxiety symptoms. The second that I look at is an overuse of nicotine. Uh, again, nicotine at higher levels can cause anxiety symptoms. The third issue that I look at, especially when I'm working with young people, is their use of ADD, ADHD medicines. These medications are very effective, but most of them are stimulants. And as stimulants, they can actually produce symptoms of anxiety, especially if they're not used carefully. So one of the things that I run into often is, for instance, working with college students who've gone off to college and 
they're taking the ADD, ADHD medicines at night to study. Well, what happens when you do that? Well, you can't get to sleep for six or eight hours. And if you try to go to sleep and aren't able to get to sleep until, let's say, three in the morning, and you've got to get up for a nine o'clock class, you're going to be sleep deprived. And that's going to predictably cause anxiety. The third issue that we want to rule out is a medical condition. Again, we're not physicians, but if we start to pick up symptoms that indicate that the person has some sort of medical condition that hasn't been addressed, it really is important to, for us to refer the person to a physician for follow-up. The next issue to consider is the severity of the symptoms or behaviors. And severity will help us focus in on one or another of the uh, diagnoses that we're trying to differentiate. It goes along pretty closely with the chronicity of the symptoms, that is, how long this person has had the symptoms. And then one of the issues that's extremely important is whether or not there are triggers, and if so, what are they, and whether or not there's a pattern to the symptoms and behaviors, and if so, what's the pattern. That's really uh, more important even than severity and chronicity. And so we'll spend some time in the history asking about when does a person have these symptoms? When are they worse and when are they not? The final issue in differential diagnosis is the one I enjoy the most. It has to do with response to intervention. And I enjoy it because I'm able to do something in that first session with the client to help them have better control over their symptoms. So let's just take anxiety to start with. One of the things that happens very often that we saw in the photograph that Katie Joy had presented earlier in this talk, it's a difficulty with catching your breath, getting enough oxygen into your system so that you can feel fully empowered. The person with an anxiety disorder often has a problem with breathing, and it's because they're breathing from their intercostal muscles, typically the muscles in their chest, rather than breathing from their diaphragm, that is the pulmonary diaphragm, pulling down and opening the lungs fully. And so one of the things that I do with my clients in the first session, if they've got an anxiety problem, is to have them sit back and get comfortable and do belly breathing. And I teach them belly breathing by having them put a hand on their abdomen down below, right above their belly, and a hand on their chest, and try to identify which opens up first or which doesn't open. And what we'll find for many people with anxiety disorders is that they're just breathing from their chest and they, their belly isn't opening at all. And what I do with that person is to help the person learn belly breathing to fill up the lungs as best they can and actually get into a rhythm where they start with belly breathing and it progresses to intercostal breathing. Now, when you do this with a person who's got a long-standing anxiety disorder, very often they will get lightheaded. And that may be of concern to them, but basically what's happening there is that the brain is getting more oxygen than it's used to. And so you can explain that to the person and then assign homework. And the homework for this person that very night is to go to bed and just before they drop off to sleep to do belly breathing. In fact, one of the things that I'll eventually do with this person when we get into treating sleep-wake disturbance, which almost every person with anxiety has, is to teach them how to do belly breathing to put themselves to sleep. And that, especially if the person's using a CPAP machine, can really very quickly, within a few nights, help them to feel a lot better. So by the time, if, if they've actually done their homework, by the time they come in to see you for your second session, they're already feeling much, much better. And a final issue to deal with in this section has to do with multiple diagnoses. We will have some clients who've got several diagnoses that are actually legitimate and valid and need to be listed. You want to list the principal diagnosis first, and then, in order of importance to treatment, list the others. Listing the others in order of importance to treatment is really crucial. Importance to treatment is something that you will develop expertise on the more you practice. There will be uh, certain diagnoses that are foundational and that you need to deal with first before you can get to those that are second. Now, very often, they will be the diagnosis the person is most painfully disturbed by, but it might not be. For example, uh, one of the things that happens with my clients who have anxiety disorders is that their sleep-wake disturbance problem, their insomnia, is really more important to treatment than the anxiety disorder itself. And so I may actually list that as the most important to treat, as the insomnia disorder, 
than the anxiety disorder. And I will explain to the client why I'm doing that. And it's also important to do that when you are being audited by an insurance carrier to have that listed that way because the services that you provide for, for instance, treating insomnia are going to be somewhat different from the services that you provide for treating, for instance, a, an acute stress disorder, an acute anxiety disorder. And so to wrap things up, diagnosis is foundational for success in intervention. Clients will do so much better if you properly provide a diagnosis because each diagnosis has different causes and symptoms and each diagnosis is treated differently, somewhat differently anyway. I wouldn't think of having my physician treat me unless she's provided me with a proper diagnosis. My physician's very good at that. She's able to diagnose me properly and then explain the diagnosis to me so that my compliance with her treatment regimen is very high because I buy into how she's defined my problem. And the other issue that's especially important with counselors is that diagnostic education empowers our clients. So many people come in to see us with misdiagnoses that they've either gotten from the web or they've been provided a diagnosis by a family member. There are several diagnoses that are really problematic if they're misdiagnosed, the largest classification of which are the personality disorders. Personality disorders are often misdiagnosed by family members who are especially bothered by the behaviors that their family member is presenting. So thanks very much for listening. Remember that we've got a free trial available to you. Contact us at faithfulbrain.com. Take care.